Hello, everybody, and welcome. Our program will begin in just a moment. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Colleen Stovall and I'm the Director of Programs and Events for AIA Miami and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event. I'd like to um, ask that you keep yourselves muted and your video off which will save us on bandwidth and give us a better presentation. We, if you would care to uh, put questions in the chat feature and we'll get to them uh, towards the end of the program. Uh, so just put them in the chat and address them to everyone. And now I'd like to introduce Lourdes Solera, who is um, the head of our Women in Architecture Committee for AIA. Hi, Lourdes. Hi, thank you, Colleen. Uh, I'm Lourdes Solera, and I am a co-chair of the Women in Architecture Committee, and I am very pleased to welcome all of you to our annual uh, Women's History Month event. And I'd like to thank uh, Design Tech uh, who is our sponsor for this event. And I'd like to introduce Naomi Harrison and Veronica Caminos, who are the uh, co-chairs uh, for this event. Naomi? Sorry, <laughs> the whole find the video button. <laughs> Hello all, um, as Lourdes said, my name is Naomi Harrison. Good evening. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. I am the co-chair of this event. And on behalf of myself and Veronica, I'd like to thank Women in Architecture Committee and the AIA Miami, whose advocacy in all aspects of her profession is action and not just words. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Um, oh, here we go. <laughs> Sorry. So thank you for joining us uh, for Women Founders in the Footsteps of Marion Manning. A special thank you to our event sponsor for tonight, Design Tech's Amy Rosado, who is on the call tonight. Tonight we have a very special um, set of people who are with us. We have um, honored guests, the family of Marion Manley. Not sure if anybody knew this was going to happen. Um, so it was a surprise for all of you. Um, we have her great nephew, Patrick, and his wife, Carolyn. And, um, well, they have two children who did a film. Ben is on. I'm not so sure if Marissa has joined us in the interim. And they have produced a very short, a short film on the life of their great aunt and great, great aunt, Marion Manley. And um, we're going to share that today. It's called Most Welcome Breezes, the story of Marion Manley. Patrick, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, audio is not coming through on this call. The Why don't you um, stop it and then before you share, there's two little boxes when you hit the share screen at the bottom, there's two little buttons you might need to um, check uh, at the bottom of the share screen before it gets shared. That might help you. Listen to the birds. There it is. Feel the wind. Embrace the open air. Build harmoniously with the landscape. Buildings should flow with the surrounding nature rather than contrast. These were the greatest influences on the architectural work of Marion Manley. As the second female to be licensed as an architect in the state of Florida and the first in Miami, 
Marion Manley contributed greatly to the development of South Florida. She was commissioned to design private homes throughout her career and made contributions to the design of the public buildings in the area. She was also the leading force behind the design of the University of Miami campus. Manley produced structures that were practical for Florida's climate and always sensitive to the local terrain. Her work covered over 50 years from 1918 to roughly 1973, with her buildings and designs spanning from South Miami to Sarasota. However, throughout her life, Manley received little recognition for her work, with her male colleagues receiving most of the credit. Despite her strong personality and extraordinary talent, she remained a virtual unknown in the still male-dominated profession. Marion Isidore Manley was born in Junction City, Kansas on April 29, 1893. She was the youngest of the nine children of Charles Haynes Manley and Marion Isidore Jones. Not much is known about her childhood other than the fact that she had a very liberal upbringing in Kansas, a hub for the American women's rights movement of the time. This laid the foundation for Manley to become a strong, independent, forward-minded individual. After attending the University of Kansas for three years, she transferred to the School of Engineering at the University of Illinois. Therefore, Manley was able to obtain an education equal to that of the men of the time, and was able to begin her study in the field of architecture. She then moved to Miami at the behest of her brother Lester, who had recently been contracted to pave Flagler Road, the first major thoroughfare in the growing city. On September 6th, 1918, Manley became the second female to receive an architectural license in the state of Florida. Upon closer examination of the license she received, evidence of Manley's ongoing struggle as a woman in a man's world is revealed. The Florida State Board of Architecture failed to replace the his within the document to her, showing that there were so few women in the field that no one even thought to change it or even looked. Nevertheless, by 1924, she was already opening an independent office, taking advantage of the newly developing towns in South Florida. It was around 1940 when Manley became involved in what was going to be her most extensive and noteworthy contribution to South Florida, the University of Miami. She began by sketching designs for proposed university buildings and layouts, when the United States began preparing for World War II in 1941, very trainees went through war training courses at the new university, and Manley was the primary architect used to continue the school's growth. Another rather impressive war-related contribution she made was showing her building techniques and materials to Russian architects to assist them with the vast post-World War II Soviet reconstruction problem. In 1941, as the male architects of Miami left for war, Manley became the president of the South Florida chapter of the American Institute of Architects. She left Miami during the summer of 1942 to take an architectural planning course at MIT. Manley returned in 1943 sketching dozens of additions and adaptations to the school's buildings and serving as the university architect. With the university president Bowman Ash in Atlanta for a year, Manley was practically in control of the architectural work. In 1945, she introduced another architect, Robert Law Weed, into the U of M project, and the two became the spearhead of what would be called the University of Miami Expansion Project. Weed was paid double the salary of Manley. After helping lay out around 100 temporary buildings known as the shacks for thousands of incoming veterans, the two architects continued designing future permanent structures and the layout of the university as a whole. In addition to Manley's outstanding work in her field, her personality and life outside work also form an interesting and unique story. Marion was a woman ahead of her time. She was a very strong woman. Um, she was a smoker, uh, smoked cools, a drinker. Um, she was a good shot. Um, very strong-willed, um, both in her professional life and her 
personal life, uh, stories of her climbing up on the roof with a contractor to make sure things are done right, that sort of thing. Um, family gatherings went on her timetable. Um, oh, she, she was a, a great storyteller, uh, just a character. She was a hoot to be around, just a hoot. Well, she was uh, uh, an interesting person to visit with any time. I remember that. And as a rule, if you wanted to stop and see her, you, she'd open the door for you. And not just for me, but for other people too. Although in the professional world she was referred to as Marion, those closest to her always knew her as Archie, nicknamed as such because of her passion for architecture. Archie used to call me and ask me to go uh, to have tea in the afternoon. She always liked tea. I guess, I don't know if Archie was going with some friends to uh, some projects in the Florida Keys and someone was asking Archie, what color should I paint, paint the house? And, <laughs> and she would say, well, you know, I can tell you the color that you can paint the house, but I'm gonna have to give you a bill. <laughs> And I met her in the 80s, and even then she had a strong personality. Then she, she was not a, she was something else. Uh, as I said before, uh, Marion was ahead of her time. Um, it is believed through family stories that she did subscribe to an alternative lifestyle. Um, she never married a man did have a series of female companions and housemates. Um, she would vacation in Key West with them. Um, she wasn't afraid to show it. I don't believe she wanted it, but uh, she wasn't afraid to show it. She was ahead of her time. In addition to being conscientious of the environment's safety, Manley also used building surroundings to her architectural advantage. But it was very interesting, and you can see here in the drawings, she indicates the predominant breezes. Look, look at how she does it. At the time, there was no AC, no internet. Okay, and then look at here. Look at this arrow. Most welcome breezes. Yeah, this is, I thought that was really great. She would always pay attention to that. One of the best portrayals of Manley's character comes in her actions concerning the City of Miami Planning Board. After being a member for four years, in 1946, she resigned from the board because, quote, It bore no relation to planning, and I could not convince the other members of that fact. In 1973, in an interview with the Miami Herald, she said, They knew something should be done but they didn't know what. Now, we are beginning to see the need for real planning and real guiding. The difficulty is that while we are attempting to correct mistakes already made, we are making the same foolish mistakes over and over again. Looking at the urban problems we see in Miami today, including traffic congestion and overbuilding, it's obvious that her assessment was spot on. The greatest characteristic Manley had was being ahead of her time. She used modern designs in areas fighting to stay traditional and was sensitive to the environment years before sustainability was even a consideration in construction. She lived with women and was a woman in a profession that is still male dominated to this day. However, Marion Manley's name is not recognized outside of the architectural community. By the time of her death on February 18, 1984, at the age of 90, her accomplishments had included designing an entire university, numerous private homes, and multiple government buildings, along with devoting large amounts of time to urban planning, sustainability, and underprivileged sectors of South Florida. And, if she had been a man, she undoubtedly would have received far greater credit. Which is why we are proud to call Marion Manley our great-great-aunt. Her desire to listen to the birds feel the wind, embrace the open air, and build harmoniously with the landscape made her truly ahead of her time.
And there was our film. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, no matter how many times I've watched it, and I've watched it a couple of times since you shared it, um, you know, as it's fitting that is equal pay day today, um, when she brought on that, that other architect, that's the male architect and he got paid double. I always get a trip out of, out of that. Um, we've, we've come some, some way, I don't know how much further, but we have. So thank you so much for joining us today, um, Ben. I know Marissa is not on as yet. I just searched through and I have not, I didn't see her. But if you and um, Patrick and Caroline, you know, wanted to just say a few words and we have time for maybe a couple questions um, from the audience, if there are any. But um, was that your voice, obviously in the background narrating that? Yes, uh, it's, been, it's been a while, but that was, I was the narrator. I, again, we, 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 went, we all went together and kind of dug through documents together. Uh, and then um, I did most of the actual filmmaking work and then the narration. Okay, yeah, I mean, it was, what, at what point did you know that you were, you know, um, a great nephew, great, great nephew to such a pioneering woman? So, so that goes to my dad's side where, where he had good like family documents of, you know, just history and um, she was just in there. But uh, one day, I believe I, it was a long time ago, but uh, one day, I think it was a History Miami exhibit um, in downtown Miami. And uh, it was, it was named that it was a, an exhibit about her. Um, and we were like, okay, hold on a second, Manly, Miami, okay. And so we went back through the documents and, and, and my dad recognized her name from, from the family. And we went back, found pictures of her, found a bunch of stuff. And, uh, and we realized how, the, how amazing the work she had done was. And so we realized like, like I loved filmmaking. My sister uh, loves fil filmmaking as well. And it was just a fun project. And we wanted to go through all the documents anyway. And so we just ended up making this film. And you, you actually found the one of her actual license um, with his on it. <laughs> that yeah, was... yeah. Yeah, that, the, the, that the, between the, um, her bringing another male architect on and him getting paid double um, and the, her license having the word his on it, those are the two, we thought the two most like, powerful like what was going on and what what needed to be fixed um and so uh yeah those were those were well two she has certainly paved the way for um you know with along with many others in the profession for where we are today and um you know with empowered um, women i am going to um i don't know if patrick wanted to say anything um, if not, we're going to go on and then you know during the, the the question and answers at the end we probably will have some more questions uh, the only thing is I was going to share the same story as before. Yes. Uh, when I was in college, uh, I was in a professional theater training center in Sarasota in the Ringling Museum. Uh, there was a building built around the Oslo Theater brought in from Italy. I was in that building for two years during my graduate studies and never knew that that building was designed by Marion Knapp. Well, I mean, that, that is um, very interesting. And, you know, I went to the School of Architecture 20 years ago. And as we are learning of late, you know, they do not teach us about these pioneering women. Um, they don't teach us about a lot of minority architects. And hopefully that will be changing. Um, I know there are a couple of professors on this, um, this, this Zoom call that are trying to make strides in, in changing that curriculum in school so that we are taught more about these women. and. Um, and just all the contributors to architecture. So thank you again for being on here. Thank I'm gonna to share my screen again to just go through some history. Um, those of you who are familiar with um, women in architecture and myself um, in particular, I love to share um, statistics and history. So before we knew we were going to actually have that video and the manly's on, you know, this was this, this slide that um, I had, we had created, which, just sums up some of the things that we just learned. You know, she was the first registered female architect in Miami, second registered female architect in Florida, first and second AIA Miami female president. So a true pioneer of um, female leadership. Thank you again for joining us. So we're gonna go through some, um, just some history in architecture, women in architecture, some early milestones. Um, 1857, AIA is founded. Um, 1873, uh, almost 20 years later is the first woman to earn an architecture degree. Um, 
1897, you know, uh, about 125 years or 24 years ago, the architecture licensure law is adopted. Um, you know, we've probably heard about Julia Morgan. Um, and then, of course, Marion Manley in 1918 is the first woman licensed in Miami. And um, I can make this all available on the AIA website um, when this is over. I know a lot of people find this very interesting. In 1927, um, the first construction block was designed called the K-Brick, and that was by a female, Anne Ketchlin. Um, in 1942, the first African-American woman is licensed, Beverly Lorraine Green. Um, in 1972, the Title uh, IX is adopted forbidden gender discrimination in federally funded um, schools. Um, up until then, a lot of schools were not actually admitting females into um, their programs. In 1980, the first woman of color is elevated to the AIA College of Fellows. And um, previously to that, you know, 1973, the first woman in architecture is founded. It took until 1980 for the first female to be the head of a school of architecture in the United States. So leadership really is struggling along with having um, more female leaders recognized because there have always been female leaders in the profession, but recognized and elevated. Um, in 1983, there is a lot more um, collection going on with um, data and gender and in 2004, Zaha Hadid is the first woman awarded the Pritzker Prize, which is the top prize in architecture. And since it was founded, only five women out of 50 have been awarded. And she was actually the, she is still the only single female, not part of a partnership that has been awarded. In uh, 2010, the Women in Architecture Fund was formed and that is a actual great resource if you guys wanna go and check that out. So, you know, current and future, um, Julia Morgan, 2014, the AIA gold medal, she actually got awarded that AIA um, gold medal posthumously. I believe only two, yes, only two, her and Denise Scott Brown are the only females in over 107 years to be awarded the AIA's top honor. So in 2021, um, we're hoping to go far beyond the numbers that we are right now, which is roughly 25,500 female architects, 0.4% of which are black female architects. I'm going to put that into perspective for you very quickly. Each of these um, figures represent 1,000 registered architects. There are just over 116,000 registered architects in the United States. The population of the United States is over 50% female, probably like 51%. Schools of architecture have approximately 50 to 52% of their students being female. And just under 50% of NCARB record holders are female. And I'm sure the architecture industry is close to a 50-50 split. Yet only 22% of registered architects are female. And as I said, dismally, 0.4% are black female, even when the population is roughly 6.5% um, uh, black female. So we have a long way to go, um, but we are making, you know, bounds um, because we have pioneering women, regardless of race, um, who have just like paved the way for us to be at the table, or as a friend of ours like to say, let's get rid of the table and start it over um, so everybody can be at it. There is not much um, statistics for women-owned firms or women-partnered firms. Um, there's, this is a graph from ACSA, which is a collegiate graph of leadership in the architecture field, in architecture, I mean, in, um, in, in schools. But you can see the fact that, you know, there is um, a very much a steep decline of females as we go up the ladder in terms of um, highest achievements in medals, awards, leadership, um, even being, you know, uh, AIA, um, being licensed architects. But tonight, instead of where are all the women leaders, we focus on the strong women leaders we have in hopes of encouraging and fostering more. We have a panel of five women who took that bold step of firm ownership, and we're going to hear from them tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce to you Terry Watson, who is a friend of mine. She is part of NOMA. She owns her own firm, Yen Design. She owns a fabulous clothing company called The Neighborhood Architect. Um, you should check her out. And she's gonna be our moderator tonight with all these um, women on the panel. Welcome tonight, Terry. 
Thank you, Naomi, and thank you, AIA Miami, for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I have the extreme pleasure of moderating this panel of beautiful architects. Um, I hope you all learn a lot about their stories and their, their paths. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, first, we have Judy Carter. Judy is the president of Cardi Architecture, a Coral Gables-based architectural planning and interior design firm, which she founded in 2012. Prior to starting Cardi Architecture, she was a principal for eight years at a firm with offices in Miami and Orlando. She has a master's of architecture degree from Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, and a Bachelor of Design and Architecture degree from University of Florida. Judy, welcome. Next, we have Jacqueline gonzalez Tuzet. Jacqueline is a founding principal of Tuzet Studio, an award-winning design and architecture studio based in Miami. Tuzet Studio is known for thoughtful, well-crafted design solutions that are mindful of the culture and history of each site and community. She is a frequent guest, critic, and adjunct professor at University of Miami and Florida International University. Jacqueline, welcome. Thank you. Anna Paula Abara is the founding principal of Via Design Studio. She holds an architecture degree from Cornell University. She founded Via Design Studio over 14 years ago and has developed a strong team of all women designers and architects. The diverse work of Via Design Studio expands from all of the homes of Habitat for Humanity of Greater Miami to international award-winning design of the library at the American Un University of Nigeria. Anna Paula, welcome. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have Alyssa Kriplin. Alyssa has over 20 years of architectural and project management experience. She founded Mac MacWork Inc. as a design services firm in New York City in 20 2003. Alyssa was a graduating member of the ULI Leadership Institute inaugural class and co-chairs the Design and Construction Symposium for the ULI LI each year. She is a past member of the AIA Miami Board of Directors and was awarded the AIA Young Architect of the Year in 2013. Alyssa, welcome. Uh, so without further ado, ladies, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I know everyone is eager to hear your story. So of course, our first question, what inspired you to, to start your practice and transition? What was the transition like from working? I'm actually gonna direct this question to Judy because I know that you were a, a partner and then turned firm owner. So we definitely wanna hear your story of why you chose uh, to eventually branch out as, an own, as your own firm leader versus staying as a partner. Um, we, we would love to know. <laughs> um, I I think that one of the things that at some point in your life happens is um, with partners um, that you really look forward and you say, okay, do I, do I want to do this for the rest of my life with these people? And, um, you know, if the answer isn't a resounding absolutely yes, um, then I think that the path is clear that you really need to move forward and do something else. And, and that was sort of my situation. Um, and it wasn't that what I was part of was, was not good. It's just that I really felt that I was able and could do better um, uh, owning my own firm. Okay, so. okay. Uh, Alyssa, what about you? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's interesting because I started in, I went out on my own first in, in New York um, because I had some amazing opportunities with the set designer from Saturday Night Live, um, bringing me super fun clients. I mean, who's going to turn that down? So, <laughs> so I started out doing that, but after a few years of doing residential, it was exactly like Judy. I realized that, do I really want to be doing this for the rest of my life? And I do feel that as a female architect, it's often very difficult to branch out beyond residential, especially if you start that way. So we made the move to Miami and I went to work for um, Discovich for uh, about six years and then with Alan Shulman for six years. I knew that I needed to learn. Miami is such a different place from New York. And I also wanted to experience uh, different types of architecture, different scales of architecture and really round out uh, 
um, my education uh, through working with different people. Um, and then it was after kind of getting comfortable in Miami and understanding and building a good client base that um, my husband and I kind of restarted. We always made the mantra that we would never be out on our own at the same time because he's a designer also. So financially speaking, we were just chickens basically. Um, and we didn't want to both have a, ourselves be um, self-supporting. So we switched on and off over the years. And then finally, we've bitten the bullet and we're, we have enough gray hairs to feel like we can make it on our own with both of us out now. Yeah. Uh, my so decision to, to, to um, work, it was exactly the same, to work with people that you want to be working with every day and to be able to choose exactly who those people are is, is a wonderful experience. So what, I guess, I mean, I know that's a bit of the advantages and disadvantages, but I think at a firm, um, or what did you learn as some of the failures of starting your company? Um, because I know, again, it's a scary feeling. So like, what are some of the failures and some of the things that you wished you all had learned early on um, before starting? Maybe if it's your, what the difference between an LLC and an S Corp or insurancing, all like the financial risk of starting your own firm is like scary, especially in our profession. So like, what are some of those lessons learned um, that you can look back on and say you wish you knew earlier? Uh, Jacqueline, I'll, I'll ask you. I'm sorry, you're on mute. <laughs> no. What are the lessons that I wish I'd, um, well, for me, um, I started, well, my husband started um, Tuesday Studio right after we had two babies. I was a vice president at Architectonica. Mm -hmm. And I had worked very hard to get to where I was. I was offered the directorship of the office. So I was in, I was in a place where I had worked towards seven years of my life. Um, but at that time, um, what was on the table was I can continue to do what I was doing and run the entire 150 person office, but I would probably not see my children much. Um, and for the first time in my life, I was, I was thinking about what my life was like besides architecture. And it just seemed that I was going to miss a lot. Um, so I too, you know, my husband and I struggled with the idea of both of us being on our own and, and, um, and, and taking that chance because financially it's, it is a big risk. So I completely understand what Alyssa's saying because that was, but, but the trade-off was freedom and, and a say about what the kind of work was and what the, what the, what the vision was going to be. And I had yet to work with anybody that I enjoyed working with as much as my husband. We are not partners because we're married. We're mar we are partners because we think the work is better when we do it together and that we balance each other's strengths. And I purposely had left him um, to go to work at Architectonica for seven years when we started dating because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't any confusion about me being a strong architect in my, in my own right. Um, but what I did learn is that the business side is frequently not taught as much as it should be probably. And if nobody really prepares you for the financial sort of, you know, and, and so there are a lot of sleepless nights and three in the morning, you know, oh my God, what are we going to do if this doesn't happen? And so that, I guess that is the trade-off, but Having been through the process of being both for me and for my life, I wouldn't have done it any other way. And now that my kids are about to go to college and I look back over the last 17 years since we started our practice, um, sure, it's been, you know, it's been, the economy goes up and down and we are a cyclical business and we, we you know, but I am really glad that, that I had the opportunity um, to write my own, my own story and to, and to do my own work even though I'm very grateful to Architectonica and what I learned with Bernardo and traveling the world and doing, you know, big international work. And I wouldn't be as strong as a designer and, and, and a professional if I hadn't done that. Um, I, I believe that the trade-off for me anyway were worth it. But it's not to say that it is without pain and without suffering at some points. And you're wondering what, you know, what, especially this last year has been just absolutely insane. Um, and there are, there are a lot of moments. And I'm sure I, I read about Archie's life and, and how she ended up you know, there was there were difficult moments there, and I think there's a lot of lessons for all of us in, in what you go through and the pain that there is to try to carve your own path. But for me, it's been worth it, and I and I highly recommend it if 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 you're suited to that sort of thing. Um, I love what I did, but for me, the the balance is really important in my life, and uh, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been possible had I not done it this way. So, yeah. And let me ask you, I know you, you know, you brought up this year being like a difficult year for everyone or 2020, shall I say. And 
you know, when you think about that, especially people who are considering maybe branching off from their company and starting their own firm, you know, did you all have any startup capital or have a plan before you actually left to branch out? Like, what was, what was your process to this? And Anna, I'll ask you. Actually, I, I work for large firms as well. I work for Perkins and Well and for Mount Smith and Hill, similarly to, to the other panelists. And I also saw a lot of, uh, I was young, got a school out of Cornell, and I looked around and I saw were males and, and uh, the boards of large corporations, and they were all male. And I saw females in the own offices that I worked and them struggling with having their kids and how to do both and how to go up in the firm. So I was lucky enough to uh, be approached by who at the time was my mentor, my AA mentor to, to uh, mentor me through the uh, licensure. And he offered to open up an office with me with a very large project, which was great. It was an $80 million airport. I thought I had made it, it was great. So he opened the office in Jacksonville and I, and I didn't wanna move back to Jacksonville. So I opened up the office in Miami. And some of the lessons learned and some of the startup, startup capital happens that sometimes when you do have partners, I think you need to go in as much as you're going in, thinking everything is going to work out. You need to know what your exit strategy is, what happens if something goes wrong. And a lot of times we're not prepared. So in retrospect, in you know, hindsight being 2020, you need to know what would happen if something goes wrong so that you can make that a little smoother. So at the time I had the opportunity when I decided, we decided to part ways, as Jacqueline said, it's, you know, 2008, the economy crashed, what do you do? So I went to buy him out and I bought him out. And then you have to come up with a lot of cash and really fast and you have to figure out how you're gonna do and sleepless nights because it was hanging on a very large project. And if I want that project on my own, do I buy him out, do I not, by how much? Um, with two kids to figure out too and have to go and present on my own and I went up, did it present to landed the project and bought him out but it took a lot of money and that money uh, there are different ways of getting it you have to either know financially that you you get it from a bank or in my case i got it from family so my parents are there to back me up and they gave it to me uh, and it's a lot of responsibility you're taking money and you don't know if it's going to work out but you bet on yourself so i bet on myself and open up the firm so yeah and judy what about you did you have any startup capital um, I had a little bit, um, but it sort of uh, was really a process of growing slowly, um, you know, taking, taking on projects, adding people. And it was really, it's really, it's been a sort of slow growth where I funded it through itself, really. Um, and, and that's possible, but I mean, there are sleepless nights. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't think I really ever drank before I had children and had a firm. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I mean, you know, and I'm not saying I drink a lot, but I'm talking about needing a glass of wine every night just to, okay, I can get through this, you know, we're going to get another project, it'll be fine, you know, so, um, and, and it gets easier, you, you learn to put that in the back of your head and know that probably it's going to work out. But at first, it's worrying. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, and speaking of like funding yourself as you like go, you know, how as females in art and architecture, you know, we have this stereotype. How do you market yourself? How do you get the projects that you desire? Um, you know, what was what was that process like? Uh, Alyssa, you know, how was that for you? Because um, again, I know that getting that's the whole goal. When you start your own firm, you want the projects that you want. You wanted the clients that you dream for, how, but how do you market yourself as a new firm owner and giving yourself that, that title? Wrong person to ask that question of, because if anybody goes to our website, I'll be incredibly embarrassed. We <laughs> haven't even done it. Oh, no. We haven't done anything. We have done no marketing. We have done a sum total of zero for the last, especially for the last three and a half years in Miami. Our absolute core business is repeat clients and word of mouth, and they just keep coming back. So, and so we spend our time treating the clients that we have as well as we possibly can. Um, 
and as long as they as long as people enjoy working with you they will come back and so it's one of the joys of having commercial clients because obviously residentials hopefully they're not building a house every year but um but for commercial at least once you've met the right people um that kind of work just keeps coming in now i promise i promised myself last year that i was going to do the website yeah still not done um, and so I, I think, look, as long as I'm busy, um, we did we did receive some negative criticism for who are these people? They don't even have a website. Um, so yes, we need to do something about that. But other than that, from a marketing standpoint, um, I, I'm not in it for the glory. Um, I, I absolutely hear Jackie, I, it's about being able to control the balance in your life between work and family. And that's not to say that I don't work way too hard, but I do love the fact that I can leave my desk for an hour if I want, whenever I want. I'm in complete control of that. So that's kind of my greatest joy for lack of marketing. So sorry, I'm not going to help you on that question much. <laughs> well, what about you, Jacqueline? How did you market yourself? Or did you, did you market or do you market in Yes, yes, we do. And um, I, I believe in marketing, but I think the best marketing is, is absolutely word of mouth and, and doing good work. Um, and, and, and this may not be popular among the younger crowd, but I do believe in, in working hard and, and making relationships in the, in, in the community and, and building your skills and just being good at what you do. Because that is why people come to you ultimately and the right kinds of people. Because otherwise you might get in, in the early years, people that are tire kicking and just want somebody young and who's going to do work for very little and this and that. I mean, I think you want to build a practice based on, on quality of work um, and on, on your skills. And when we started our, our business, we made a conscious effort. We, we did not, you know, approach former clients out of respect for my former employer um, at that time. But we had worked with so many land use attorneys. We had so many relationships in the community of people that knew us as, as really good designers, as people that could be trusted with complex projects that, we were lucky to get a couple of really key projects early on. Um, and that built on some press naturally, organically, which is the best kind of press. But once we had a little bit of that, the time to do marketing is when you don't need it. And so at that point is when we turned, I had a, a colleague of mine from Cornell and, and he did our first website from Dbox. And you know, taking a little time, it does help uh, to, to spend some time putting your image out in the world because we're all, I mean, we are people that are, are visual people. and. If they don't get to know you, especially now, um, this may be the only way they, they know you. So I, I do think it's helpful, because, especially, you know, we know that our brand is not for everybody and we only appeal to a small sliver of the population. So we do have to do um, marketing in the sense of at least telling our stories ourselves. And what I've found, though, after paying marketing people and not paying them is we almost always write our own social media and our own stories because we want, we know exactly how we want to talk about it. It's not a commodity. I'm not trying to get you to, to buy pancakes. It's about the work and the story, you know, and the best writing and the best thinking when I, when I don't have a lot of work, I try to spend time writing about the work or getting awards or, you know, or getting published because that's the kind of client that I like to work with because they give us the time and space to do the kind of work that we like to do. So for, for the kind of practice that we've tried to build, it's super important to get, um, that 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 group of people that are actually really interested in design and in in craft and in building things well, which let's face it, you know, Miami is not has not been in the past that that kind of market. So you really have to you know you have to get your get your brand out there so people know you exist. But I think it also just comes from having done um, you know getting those approvals from cities that are tough to get and, and just people knowing that you're uh, that you're skillful and that you, you're good at what you do. I think that's that's the best of everything that 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 you can do to build your, your firm and your, and your practice. Um, yeah. Thank you for Jackie. <laughs> um, so as myself, like I'm an emerging young professional and I know that I have a galore of mentors guiding me along this path. Um, do you, any of y'all, I'm going to, I'm going to ask this question to all the panelists. Um, do you have any significant mentors that help you along the way and specifically any female mentors uh, that had guided you early on. You know, I had the pleasure of when I was in my last year of grad school, I had, had the extreme pleasure 
to uh, intern with a African-American female architect here in Miami who basically laid out the foundation for me. And it was a, I mean, it was life changing. So I'm very eager to know if, if you all had any mentors or specifically any female mentors or male that, that helped you um, get to where you are, good or bad, but did anyone help you along the way? I had a terrible one and I'll just go first. I did not have good um, female mentors. But it made me better in the sense that now as a, as a female principal, I'm very much not that. You know, I, I try to really, I mean, the message that I got as a young architect was all you need, literally, this was said to me, is to be blonde, to show up and to just, you know, put it all out there. And, kind of, and I was like, that is absolutely not going to be <laughs> what we're putting out there, you know. And so that was just bizarro world. And then I've had other female uh, bosses that that really wanted to show you that you had to grind and you had no life and that was the you know and so the thing that I got back from that even my best friend who's a, a, a principal in one of the local firms uh when I had the baby she's like you know what do you mean you want balance what the heck are you talking about you're a vice president you just got to get back in there in the saddle and I was like no I don't <laughs> I don't have to do that I can I can do whatever I pretty much want and so I had a lot of people telling me what they thought was the way to survive it and I think everybody should listen to their own internal voice. It's great that you had one. because, and, and I'm trying to be one for other people because I didn't have one. But uh, yeah, no, my mentors were the absolute opposite of what I think you should tell young women. No, you know, absolutely listen to what's right for you. <laughs> I, I didn't have any. I, I'm like struggling to think of any. I mean, I apart from professors and graduate school, I, I just, I... I, I worked with some, um, but I, I really did not have any female mentors. And I, 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 I guess there, there weren't that many of us around, you know, um, particularly like a generation ahead of, right. of me. Um, so I feel like I, I lost out on a whole um, sort of learning experience that I could have had. Yeah. But, I would agree with that, but I think that I, we, I was lucky to have male bosses who didn't treat me any differently from anybody else in the office. So rather than needing to be um, actually treated differently from anybody else in the office, just to have these bosses who were so completely fair and even handed and, and they pushed everybody off the edge of the diving board and, and let you take as much um, responsibility as you are willing to take and they have mentored me in a way to be a boss and to be a leader um, in the way I treat my staff I'd like to give them as much responsibility as they are happy to take um, and not try and force them into a particular path um, yeah yeah I can I can actually attest to that too because I mean you know who, who I consult with Ethan and and Rizzy uh, at r and and they are the exact same. They know they they definitely molded me. I've been on their team for five years, so I've also had good male mentors. Um, my very first mentor actually was, I'm pretty sure you all know him, uh, Michael Lingerfeld, uh, 2011 AIA Florida's president. He was my mentor all the way through undergrad and grad school. We talked every three to four months uh, up until his passing in 2018. So I've also had good male and one and some female uh, mentors. So Anna, what about you? Did you have anyone to guide you along the way, positive, negative? Yeah, the the one the the gentleman that was my partner, he was a male and he was my mentor. And you might think that only females uh, in a lot of ways get discriminated or don't get fair chances. And he was an amazing designer, award-winning designer, and he was Asian. And he suffered a lot and he did not get a fair chance and he did not get all the credit and he struggled a lot and he had a lot of difficulties in a very large firm and he did have a glass ceiling as well. So it didn't only happen to females, it did happen to males and, and I saw it through him and he was older than me and I could see it and he wanted to guide a lot of the other minorities in the firm to, to see and how we could uh, break those glass ceilings and what we could do. And I didn't necessarily see myself differently and he didn't for sure treat me differently. We became partners in that way. So uh, you, I, I did get my clues from him and see what he had to go through to learn. And that inspired me to try to be as much of a mentor as I could, which is why I purposely 
look to hire women and uh, women designers and to, you know, hopefully to help and inspire them to be the best they can be, regardless if they're female or male, but to give that extra push and that extra support. Yeah. Yeah, so today, as we all know, is All Women's Equal Pay Day. Uh, just a little bit of a history. Um, October, well, a little bit of a recap. October 21st is Latina Women's Equal Pay Day, and August 22nd is uh, Black Women's Equal Pay Day. So I, I would want to know, like, what's the industry's organization culture like 10 years ago for women who are working, you know, working mothers, uh, pregnant working mothers, like, do you feel that, you know, the industry has progressed any? Um, what was it like back then? What is it like now? Um, Judy, I'll, I'll ask you since you were, you kind of read a big, you know, big firm. Um, well, well I, I found it interesting that you ask only 10 years, right? Because 10 years <laughs> well, seems so back. recent. We can go, let's, let's Maybe go back. Because I'm old. We can go back as far as you all like. How about that? I mean, my, my children are, um, are 19 and 17. So I, um, and I worked, you know, I worked until the Friday and I had both of them on a Monday. The, um, and, you know, that's just how it was. I mean, it wasn't, um, it, it, it just, it, it was sort of not that big a deal, I guess, really. Yeah. Um, um, I, I never felt, I have to say that in, in, my entire career, there have been very, very few times that I really feel that I was um, um, dealt with as a woman rather than as an equal, or just as an architect. Mm -hmm. um, those, and, and maybe it's only two, what one particular client group, um, but, and I, we do a, a lot of public projects. Most of my entire career has been public. And in the public sector, I have to say that um, people are generally very good in treating you as an equal, even 20 years ago. I mean, and, and those are times, a lot of times I was in a room, 25 men, only woman, and I never was made to feel lesser or what I had to say was not um, um, something that was valuable. So, th I mean, that, that's been my experience. And Jacqueline, what about you? You have the same experience? Uh, no, <laughs> I will say I, for the first, um, before I had children, all I wanted was to be treated the same as men. And I, you know, professionally I was, my abilities were, but there was in the beginning of, of, of my internship, a couple of experiences with clients and, um, and employers and supervisors that were unpleasant in the sense that they, you know, you, you just felt uncomfortable in the, in the workspace because very much they were either hitting on you or asking you out or telling you you look cute and that, you know, it was just inappropriate stuff mm -hmm. that made the workplace uncomfortable. So that was the only time that I, that I did see that. And I, and I made it my mission as I grew in seniority that if I ever spotted that, I, you know, I, I stopped that cold. And that used to happen, I think, a lot more. People have gotten, you know, a lot more aware of, of that not being appropriate. But in terms of, of my capabilities or my promotion or my growth in a firm, that never kept me back. I mean, I, I did my work and I was rewarded for it. There was a moment, um, and I won't name the firm, but um, I was supervising 15 people. And I found out that one of them recently hired was making more than me. And I was a little taken back. <laughs> And uh, I addressed it, uh, it was resolved, um, but it, and I've never forgotten it. And, and um, I do think it's because I'm a first generation Latina. I was happy to be at the table. I worked the hours that were asked, I did whatever was asked and the talk about money was hard for me. I culturally just, you know, it was just, that wasn't being super nice. And I just got raises left and right because I just worked so damn hard and people were like, you know, this woman, you know, give her, give her the raises. But, I wasn't actively advocating for myself the way I think uh, men do. And I have now that I'm in the position of, of, of listening to people ask for money, there's a distinct difference between where men think they are and where women think they are. And there's a humility um, and an almost a shyness about asking what they're worth that I still see that. Um, and, and it's unfortunate. Uh, and I think that's just a cultural thing that we, we, we teach our girls to be nice and, and men to be a little bit a little bit more, um, but yeah, I've seen it my whole professional life. It has not affected me. I have, I have moved around it, but it's there. 
it, it's still there. Um, and to the extent that people in leadership call it out and root it out when they see it, then it then it's, doesn't need to be a, a major factor in your experience as an architect, but I, I have seen it for, for sure. Thank you. You're absolutely correct. And, and One moment. The way to change that is to, uh, teach our next generation to not be apologetic for asking for what they're worth, not to stand with their legs crossed and be diminutive, to stand up and be strong and, and own it and own the table and lean into the conversation. Um, yeah, there's been, especially in commercial architecture, there's so many, and the development groups are so often uh, kind of male dominated mm -hmm. um, to the extent of having a, a and we were sitting at the table when I was on a project with Alan Shulman and the client said, you know, women can't drive at night. They just can't see. They have no depth perception. <laughs> and Alan looked at me absolutely terrified because he's like, she's going to kill him. <laughs> kill him. Um, but you're so used to that. You, I, you know, at some point you have to laugh it off and feel kind of sorry for his archaic kind of attitude but but it's definitely still out there so have you all had to address any like you know unbiased uh, regards like on site or or like you know while you're just generally doing your job you know as an architect have you had to address anything from other professionals or consultants throughout your you know your day yes and I believe in addressing it forcefully and right up front and don't let it slide. Mm -hmm. Even in Miami, because, you know, I let a little bit pass if you're older Cuban and you call me mijita or mommy or whatever, but no more. I mean, we're, we're at a place where I think there's been enough said about this. There's been enough news about this. I had a client last year said, I am never going to compliment a woman anymore because, you know, with this me too stuff, I can't say anything. And I said, you know something, I have an 18 year old son. And I told them, please leave your stuff in your pants. And if somebody asks you not to touch them or approach them, that's a no. That's a hard no. I don't think that's a hard concept. So if you're having trouble like understanding that still, then that's on you. I mean, because I don't think that's really that complicated. The fact mm -hmm. that it's still a conversation, and this is these are big developers that are supposedly traumatized that they can't, you know, excuse me. Um, it's it still happens. Job sites are very male dominated. It, it is still that kind of a thing. I tell every woman that I mentor to, if it's happened to you, to address it up front. I've had some difficult conversations with bosses. I can, I can address this with this client or you can address this with this client. And I can guarantee you, you will not like it the way I will address it with this client. So you better address it with this client because you need to make this a safe workspace for all of us. I did that when I was 19. So, I mean, I highly recommend that women use their voice and don't take it because if you take it, 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 it just never gets better. You don't have to become embittered by it. You don't have to be angry by it. It just call it out and say no and move through it. It's going to happen. It does happen. Um, but it doesn't need to, you don't need to be victimized by it and you don't let it lead to, I, one of the things that I found was so sad is, is people that are habitual um, people that offend what young women at, at the job place. How many women quit that position? Don't get that promotion leave the profession because other people didn't speak out. So you, you must use your voice. And if you see it happening to somebody else, also, you know, it, I, I happen to be a kind of person you'd have to have a death wish to really approach me if I don't want you to touch me because I'm going to be like, excuse me, you know, but some girls are shy and they're afraid to say something. I know those girls, I helped those, you know, if I saw it when I was younger, I would help them. And as a senior person, I would go to the mat for anyone I saw go through that. And I think all of us have to, yeah. it, 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 is, it is still happening. I think you're right. It has to be forceful and it has to be like nipped in the butt. It happens a lot there. Recently, we go, we've gone to presentations where we do get asked uh, if somebody else is joining because we, we go against groups of males and we get questioned as if, you know, somebody else is missing at the table. Um, my father works with me. My father's considerably older. I've been asked if he's my boss or if he's going to decide something. And no, like he works for me. Like, no. And it has happened many times when inappropriate behavior like that happens. Somebody calling you honey, somebody calling you sweetie to the point that in meetings I've been asked uh, to not to worry about it because, you know, I can just go and paint it pink later to make it pretty. And you just 
bite their heads off right there in front of everybody and they never ever will do that again <laughs> but you just have to stand your ground and you get mad later but at that time you well my, you one, of my, right one of my pet peeves is being called girl oh. so i have a whole speech about what is a girl and what isn't a girl it's <laughs> not that I, I don't know if it's even appropriate for me to say it here there's too many people i usually say it in a smaller but it like and, and I'll say it in a crowd with 20 men. There's a, there's a definition. They don't have their period. They don't have breasts. They don't have pubic hair. That's the girl. That's, that's a girl. I am not a girl. So it's truly one of my, it drives me crazy. It's or you're sweetie or different. you're honey. <laughs> I think I, I'll use that one day. That's actually pretty straightforward. <laughs> It's straightforward. <laughs> yes, it's factual. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, I mean, I think that sort of thing you do it the first time it happens, you call it out, and if and if you embarrass people in a boardroom, so be it. You, right. you do it with a smile on your face. Absolutely. The person that who needs to feel bad about doing that is the person who did it, not you. Yeah. No. 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 But I've done it as that as yeah. recently as a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yes. That's what I'm saying. It's happening all the time. Is you're going to be ready for it, and then you. I know it's hard the first time it happens. You're shocked that it even could happen, but you really quickly have to pivot into no. This is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And um, Anna, Paula, I want to ask you really quickly because I, I want everyone to recognize your initiative on this. Uh, you make it uh, your mission to hire only female architects. Um, so what is it like, you know, running a firm with female or young designers? It's amazing. It's inspiring. It's amazing. I can, I'll do it for as long as I can. I think if we can help each other out, it's, it's amazing. We can only understand what it is to be a mom and I have to run a farm and do all those things. Not that men cannot do it, but being a mom is being a mom. And I think it, it's really important if we can mentor other women, I think it makes it that much more special. And I appreciate every day that I get to work with the amazing women that I work with. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so I'm gonna ask um, specifically Alyssa and Jacqueline, I know you all run businesses with your husbands. How is it balancing that life as a mom and, and just the challenges that's possibly running a firm with your partner and do your gender roles affect your firm structure? So first of all, I would never have married Marsh if you didn't already have a very good understanding of there being very little gender roles in our family. The only reason I cook is because I don't like his cooking. <laughs> um, but otherwise, um, we literally are completely split down the middle when it comes to um, caring for our child. In fact, it was during the recession that um, our daughter was born and Marsh stayed home with her for a year, um, partially because of the lack of work and I was working for a bigger firm, so I, had, I maintained the position, but and I was super jealous of him. But, but the number of people who, when they heard that he was going to be staying home, said, you're leaving your daughter home with your husband? And I was like, he's her father. I mean, yeah. if you can't look after her, who can, really? But it was just incredible. All these women were looking around at me going, there's no way we would be leaving our children home with our husbands. And I was like, see, that's a sad state of affairs. When you don't trust your own children with your spouse, that's pretty horrific. So, but from a work standpoint, um, we have very, very, very different ways of approaching things. We always swore we would never work together um, for exactly that reason. But we, he's a landscape architect. So we do kind of technically have different streams within the firm. So it's so important, I think, that we have the same design background we met in at Berkeley. Um, but so we have the same design background. It's so important to be able to have those conversations and really um, kind of brutal design conversations where you can you can say things that you would never necessarily say to a partner that you weren't married to. Yeah. That's, that's horrific. Just stop again. Um, so we can we can do that, and it and it's understood kind of in the context. Um, yeah. But we do try and not work together. I think as much as I think I understand Jackie and Carlos do. Sorry. Um. 
Well, we, I met Carlos um, <clears throat> working on the Satai. Uh, I was hired to be his project architect. And at the time he had terrorized the entire studio and they were afraid to work with him because he didn't like anything that, he, you know, he's a very picky, he's a very nice man, but he's incredibly uh, rigorous and picky. He had come from Architectonica and was just like this guy who's super intense. And he and I clicked and we worked beautifully together because we, we balance each other's strengths. Um, he's very meticulous and very detail oriented. I'm more macro, more concept, more storytelling. So we kind of really, I always say we, we work together because the work is actually better when we do it together. But I did leave him for seven years because he said, we were working together. We did this at It was going great. And then he said, you know, there's one firm in Miami you should work for. It's Architectonica because that's where he had just come from. Um, he had been a vice president. And I said, you know, that's not a bad idea. So I, I went there and I stayed, I didn't tell anyone I knew anything. You know, I just went there. I worked my way up from a project manager all the way to VP. I was running the multifamily. I traveled to Hong Kong. I was managing Singapore. So I did all of that. And I felt like I was an architect in my own, you know, in my, I believe in, in being strong in your own right. I never want to be the woman behind the man. I don't want any confusion about that. You know, and so I, I thought it was really important that, that I became my own kind of self. And when we, we partnered again, it was because, it, it, as I said, it was because we had just had the two kids um, and, and I actually had been running Stantec or Ad Inc. and it, that didn't work out. And so, you know, it was, it was sort of fate. I went to work for Related for a year. I funded the office because they doubled my salary to do Apogee. And while I did that and I suffered in the dark side for eight months working for a developer, that's what funded our studio. That's how we started. Um, I would, I, I love working with him. Sometimes I want to kill him because he's slower, uh, you know, he's like a slow design process. And I'm like, you know, like, so we have a different speed, but yeah. when we come together, it's like having your most trusted design advisor next to you that you know that at the end, you're going to get to the same place, but your routing there is, is different. And the best projects we have ever done are the ones that both our hands are in it. And I can't tell you where I start and he begins. Like, I don't remember. And people often mistake that I'm the tough one because I'm like, I am pretty tough sometimes. But he is even like, you know, he is, so we, we just care about different things. At the end of the day, I think all good partnerships have to be at the end, the work is better because you did it together. And, and that's what, I will also say that the, the perks of it is if you're obsessive like we are and you love what you do and you're passionate about it, when we travel and when we're out, it, it's, a, it's just a lifelong conversation that I feel very blessed to have. You know, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to, con but we do draw a line. When we go home and we're with our kids in the yeah. bedroom, no mass because otherwise you have no life and that's dull frankly that's dull to be constantly talking about architecture and not having a balance so you gotta you gotta carve your your private life our kids actually went on strike in barcelona they were like we are not doing this anymore i was on a, on a gaudi tour and they're like you're killing us this is awful we will never be architects and, and then i realized i had gone too far but so anyway. you had that same experience in barcelona yeah, i was i was gonna ask you and uh, judy and anna what is it like for you all as mothers and and wives and work life because listen i have no life and i am by myself you know maybe it's because i'm in that process of are testing and wrapping up but i have absolutely no life so how is it like for you all to balance this work life as a firm owner mother wife you know what is what is your experience i see elizabeth saying that unmarried women out there choosing the right partner is everything i agree a hundred million percent after choosing what you're going to do for a living it's who you're going to be with especially you know um i i'm twice married this is my second rodeo and my first marriage was with a banker who just did not understand what the hell i was doing it was like what's going on here and i i you know i cannot be bothered at two in the morning when i'm trying to get a project out somebody calling me and asking me what I'm making for dinner. That just wasn't going to happen. So choosing the right spouse and, and or having uh, a good partner and family support, it is the reason that I'm here anyway, in, in, a, in a position that I'm in, because I, you know, it just, it really is a support. You know, my mother, yeah. I have an abuela who rocks, who has helped me with my kids and gives me the peace of mind. So it's not just my partner, but it's also family support. And I do think it's really important um, to find whatever support network it is for you. Um, and when you choose that partner, make sure that they are, that you are aligned and that you're growing together strongly and you're, and, and he's supportive of your, you as a professional, because otherwise it's very difficult. So, yeah. Anna and Judy, how, how about you all? 
I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to balance. I have to say it's really hard. I don't know. There's no trick. Just <laughs> day by day. Yeah. I think Jackie is right. It's, there's a support system. You can do it on your own. So it is, you know, it is a, your partner. It is your parents. It is your grandparents. It is your friends. It is, it is a support system. But I think there's no magic. It's a lot of hard work. And somebody like described it once. And I thought it was such a good description. It's like the, the thing that you see in the circus where you have a bunch of sticks and a bunch of plates that they're being balanced by the stick and they're all spinning. And they have to keep on spinning. And at some point you're paying attention to one so the other ones don't drop and they start to slow down and you have to rush to the other one and keep on spinning so that they, none of them drop. But they're not all spinning at the same time because you have two hands and you know, so you do the best that you can and you spin them as much as you can and you, you, some of them are gonna slow down a bit and you have to pay attention to that one or the other ones you're, st and you just go with it and do the best that you can. That's I think how you do it. Yeah, yeah. So just a few more questions, ladies. Uh, and this one specifically, I, I would love to know, um, you know, there are a lot of organizations out there for us uh, as architects, but have you found joining any professional organizations like AIA, IDA, uh, Urban Land Institute helpful for females practicing in architecture? And if not, how do you feel that it can be improved? This is for everyone. So uh, Anna, you can start or? <laughs> Actually, I had joined the organization that I used to support a lot. Um, were not art necessarily architecture based, but it was more for uh, children and, and giving them a chance. So I was on the board of Take Stock in Children that were children in uh, in high risk uh, environments that were really good students and you got them in middle school, mentored them and guaranteed a college scholarship. So uh, I believe uh, not necessarily in design, some of them are, you know, wanted to be architects and then they approach you that they want mentorship uh, because they, they see who you are. But I think you have to also uh, go, with, go with your passion and help where you can. And if everybody helped a little bit, we would go a long way. But I do believe AIA and all those programs and what the AIA is doing and all these things that we're doing do inspire, do mentor, and do uh, give a lot of support to people who are, uh, who are females and who are minorities and who do want to, you know, learn about the profession. Yeah. Alyssa, what about you? Um, I'm not a huge proponent of... of uh, I spend, I have a very limited amount of time um, but try, between trying to balance everything for all of these organizations. So I have a tendency to try and focus on one for a number of years and try and get the most out of it. Um, and right now I've been kind of very involved in ULI um, and would highly recommend um, people look into the Leadership Institute. Um, it's a very well balanced group of, of people who are really um, kind of emerging. Um, it's not for, 22 year olds, it's not for straight out of college, it's kind of mid-career people. Um, I tend to steer away from women, like women focused groups, because I think it's important that I spend my time in groups where men can see me participating in other groups that they, especially with ULI, for example, which is a lot of developers and realtors and so on. Um, I think it's important for me as a woman to be mixing it with them, not not directly focusing on, on necessarily supporting a women's group. Yeah. Uh, Judy, what about you or Jacqueline? Do you all have any, any, did you find that any of these organizations are beneficial to you all? Yes, I, I, I think the AIA has done a, does great programming. It's, it's a really good way of knowing what other architects are doing. I always feel very connected and understanding and sometimes what you should be doing or what you could be doing you know you see people a couple steps ahead of you it kind of gives you a little I think that's super important especially for people like me that didn't have a lot of mentoring um, that that's where I got the information that I got about what I needed to be doing I also um, travel to see uh, green build a lot because I'm very interested in environmental and sustainability issues um, and for me it was a way of getting us out of, of the practice of how it's done in Miami and seeing how it's done uh, at a national level, and that's also important because it inspires you to see when developers or clients are telling you, no, we can never do that, and you're hearing case studies and you're talking to other professionals. It's very empowering to, to have a bigger and wider perspective. 
And, and the last thing I'll say is that now the stage of life, and, and you know, I believe women's lives, people's lives are seasonal. And the season that I'm entering is the emptiness. I think uh, Judy and I are about the, I have a senior in high school, I have a freshman in college. And what I'm seeing is that now some space is making, some space is opening up and where I was, I have more time. It's like, where do I give that, that time? Because you can't give it all to work. And now that I finally have that time, where am I going to give it? And for me, it really has to do with the environment. So I, I'm chairing the Resiliency Day for, for ULI. I'm going back into the classroom to teach about that because I, I see the issue with the planet being so dire that it, it's like, it's for me, it's not enough to take care of my kids and my studio. It's like, what are you going to do about the community? And I, and I think the, all of these organizations, um, whether you're on a board or you're serving with your professionals, I'm on the history board. I'm on, you know, I'm on the University of Miami real estate board because I'm trying to talk to those guys about resilience and sustainability. Those are the ones that need to hear it. You know, I, I, I think that whatever you can do to use your voice when you have the time. And by the way, I don't mean to imply that we all have all this time because I haven't had really the time until this moment. I've been trying to, to raise my children to, to build a practice and, and to not go crazy. So yeah. I don't want to give anyone the impression that it's easy and that at all times I'm doing because it's not, there, there have been days and, and years that I feel like, man, I just, this is terrible. You know, I'm the last mom to show up with the ballet shoes, my kids crying in the corner. You know, I've been that mom. So anyone who thinks that this is easy, it's not. But the reward is you're writing your own story, you're doing your own work, and, and I believe it's worth it. But I don't want to, I don't want to oversimplify that, that it's, you know, rainbows and, and unicorns, because it's a lot of hard work. And some days it doesn't go well, and you're not balancing great. So it's a work in progress. Yeah. So ladies, we do have one last question from the audience. Uh, they want to know how did you all manage the new experience of running the business side of the practice of, of your own business, specifically being, being our profession to tech, that's technically oriented what advice would you share about getting reach and exposing exposure for new clients? So I'm get, I believe they're just asking, you know, again, how do you do, how do you go about getting the clients you want um, and getting yourself exposure to new clients and branching out? I think this, the question started with the business side. I think on the business side, none of us are taught anything about business or know much about business or balance sheets or, or the financials. I think in architecture school, most architecture schools don't prepare us at all for this. So I think it's up to us to really get educated. So as for myself, it's classes and courses and certifications and all kinds of things that I could get exposed to, to learn that business side, because I don't think you can be an amazing designer and you can fail a business miserably because the business side and the design side are not necessarily the same thing. They have to work together. So you have to get educated on that. And uh, I believe on the marketing side and getting clients and how you do it from the four of us that are here. If you, I think we all said similar things that we build ourselves as professionals first. We build those relationships. We develop who we were and, and people got to know us in the community and we got to know who we were. We get, we got to grow and we use those relationships to, to build our own personal portfolios and our own personal styles, so then reach back to those relationships that we built to get those contacts to be able to start getting work mm -hmm. and in some of the cases here we had partners so who possibly already had work we bought into partnerships we bought into businesses they already had work and then kept growing from there yeah well also um ironically this morning i was on a um, panel for miami-dade county um small business and it was a, a female female panel and um the, the only reason i was on that panel because it was mostly um uh, females um, from different different groups, Port of Miami, airport, etc., um, was to really, they asked me, you know, did it help? Did it help being a small business? And so I would say that one, because I've always done public projects, getting um, certified and getting um, on those lists, whether it's Miami-Dade School, not that I really recommend, it, but <laughs> let's say Miami-Dade County, I mean, <laughs> There's, there's drawbacks, right? But the issue with your firm and starting a firm is that you immediately need to get projects within the firm's name. So I had hundreds of thousands of square feet that I'd signed and sealed for, you know, uh, was responsible for, was principal in charge of, but starting Cartier Architecture, I didn't have any projects in Cartier Architecture. 
So to have somebody say, okay, you know, we're going to do this as a set aside, which, you know, that's what I started with is doing Miami-Dade County public school projects. And then those leapfrog um, and you suddenly you have projects under the firm and then it sort of all merges to the previous ones that you've had. Um, and, and what Anna Paula says is true. You then access all of your other contacts. But the key to getting, and Miami-Dade County is really good with this, it, it, to getting projects under your firm name, um, I think they give a, a lot of, you know, um, are, are open to, and, and that was extremely helpful for me. So I would say get certified, um, get on those vendor lists, you know, and, and start that way with small projects, small public projects. Mm -hmm. My teacher in uh, business architecture and business class at the University of Melbourne was taught by a guy who'd lost his practice. Fabulous. <laughs> um, needless to say, he, he, I'm not sure that we learned a whole lot, but um, I was lucky enough when I was at Ziskovich to sit between Bernard and Surya for most of the six years. And during that time, we wrote proposals and we discussed the legal issues of every single line in these proposals and we finessed every single word and um, when people ask me now what's the if when you're going out on your own what's the most important thing you need to know it's like writing a watertight proposal mm -hmm. it develops the good relationship with your client if you have language in there that is too aggressive or too biased one way or the other you lose a relationship if you have ambiguities that you end up fighting about later you lose the client there's just so many things. It's not about being hard and being tight about it. It's about being fair and being clear so that when you have to have a difficult discussion later on, everybody understands what ground they're on and you can point to something and say, here it is. This is why this is in here to, to help resolve this exact question between our services. So, um, and a lot of people, when, they, when they're when they working, at, especially in the larger offices, they may never touch a proposal ever. If you're not, if you can get access to those proposals and understand the contract that you were working under, and then when disputes come up, understand how the firm is dealing with it so that you can learn from your actions and how they impact a final product, how they impact your fees, how they impact your relationship going forward with your clients. Um, it's kind of incredible to me that that this kind of information is not shared more widely in firms because I really do feel it's probably the it impacts the legal strength of of the firm and it's what allows it, it's what allows you to keep doing business. Yeah. 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 So this is a, a personal question um, on this topic, and then I'm going to pass it back to Veronica. So as every all of you all of course have had gotten your license and you sat for your AREs. So why do you feel that, or do you feel that practice management prepared you or did not prepare you for the business side? Because that exam is strictly business. Um, so it's, it's, it's odd that, you know, everyone that I speak with or any, any professional feels like that, that they don't have the experience because it basically takes you to a business student at that point. So why do you feel, or how do you, how do you think that test or could be better? <laughs> um, and, or did you feel that that at least gave you a little bit of inkling of running your business? I think it took us so change. long ago. Yeah. I, I, I don't, even I don't remember any business questions. I don't think so, 25 oh, years ago. We took it so long ago. I took it so long ago, it was one day. and was There was weren't any business questions. So. It, was, it was not even like you guys are walking the park. No. Understandable, because I took it about a year and a half ago and passed, and I don't remember. So that's great to know. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, well, ladies, you thank you so much for your time. We've learned a lot from you. Again, you are uh, my inspiration and a lot of other emerging professionals' inspiration. So we, we thank you for keep pushing forward in this, in this profession. We're watching you, and we, we adore you. I'm going to pass it back to Veronica. Yeah, thank you personally um, from, from the committee. The, um, I think this was wonderful. I super enjoyed it. Um, I love the women we selected. You each have your own personality. You made it fun. Um, my takeaways, um, in the middle of Women's History Month and on uh, Equal Pay Day is to 
as professionals and women, let's not conform ourselves with hashtags or slogans. I think um, if, if anything we can take away from this conversation is that progress is earned on a day-to-day -day basis um, and that showing up is a huge part. Uh, I, th I think attrition is just like the most painful thing to see in the, in in our profession, especially women that drop out. Um, I think what Jackie says that there's different stages in your life and you can't have it all all the time, but you can choose what you want at this time and what you need at this time. And to keep that kind of in mind that, especially as a professional architect, you're always learning. It's a profession where you never know it all, but you also have different stages in your life and that you know what you need and what your family needs. I love the conversation about selecting your partner wisely. I think um, I have a daughter. I keep telling her that all the time. I'm extremely in love with my husband, who's also an architect. And um, I love the fact that, like some of your partners, um, he's a true partner. And I think we're lucky enough that our generation of men um, actually enjoy partaking in household tasks and raising their children. They benefit from a different relationship, I think, from with their kids than maybe our parents did. Um, but I think it's great that, you know, we have that conversation that we share the household tasks, we share the child rearing responsibilities, um, especially now during the COVID year. So um, thank you all for your, uh, for your gracious participation and for sharing all your stories. I wish we could go on much longer because I'm fascinated. Um, hopefully we can re repeat this at some point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you for having us. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, there will be a recording of this um, program uh, available. I'll email it to everybody, the link to the YouTube of the program if you're interested. Okay, thanks Colleen. Thanks everybody, great program. Have a good night everyone. Bye, take care. Thank you everybody. <laughs> Thank you ladies, have a great night.